Welcome into the Inside Bassmaster Podcast, episode 144. And Kyle, Jesse, we always do the Inside Bassmaster Podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company at the beginning of the month. It's always the pattern of the month episode. So we kind of put our heads together and thought, hey, what are the fish going to be doing this time of the year? And who should we talk to on the podcast? So Kyle, we've got Alabama's own Justin Hamner coming off a of top 10 to end the year at the St. Lawrence River. Now he's back down in, in uh, the state of Alabama. And we're going to talk a little September fishing with him on this episode of the podcast. Yeah, hey guys, how's it going? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. No, no. Go ahead and know, cut you off right there. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> we, know, we know how excited Justin is because he was just telling us how uh, the month of September is his favorite time of the year to fish. Is that right, Justin? Absolutely. It's the hottest time of the year. The fish are biting the least. It, it's fantastic. Come to Alabama, go out there and catch three fish, <laughs> and then hit a sandbar and actually enjoy yourself. <laughs> well, all I know is that you're bringing uh, – a positivity to the podcast that we need. I love the art behind you. You know, if you do catch three bass in a tournament and come home, looking at that piece of piece of art on the wall is definitely something that's going to be like a brightening to your day. So I love that you you do have that kind of art hanging around your house. I don't have that right behind me. Not yet. Yeah, well, I mean, see, that's kind of the deal. Every time I do a podcast, I got to have this behind me because my wife painted it. And that's awesome. Uh, being gone for however many months a year. Got to get in some brownie points when you can. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> so, Kyle, we talked about it, and uh, September is is really difficult for us, but one reason we wanted to talk to him was the opportunity for School of Fish. So, Justin, uh, right off the top, I mean, when you're, when you're leaving the house, headed to the lake, uh, is, is that one of the things that's on your mind is the opportunity for School and Fish, especially maybe the first – you know, the 30 minutes of the day or maybe the, the last 30 minutes of the day, something like that, you got to capitalize on when you get there? Yeah, the first thing I'm thinking about is if I'm there at daylight, we're starting with the top water. We're going to run, you know, shade lines, things like that, grass lines. First thing with the buzz bait, you know, whatever the deal is. But top water, first thing in the morning, and then as soon as that sun starts getting up, that's when those fish really start feeding out in the middle, and, you know, that's really what makes this month so difficult is because these fish are just roaming around in the middle of these lakes. And, you know, you start having those schooling opportunities. And that's one thing I absolutely love is the schooling fish because it doesn't matter how hot it is. The hotter, the better, it seems like. That's when you can go out there and capitalize on those schooling fish. So, and there's, to me, it's not a more guaranteed bite. When you start seeing that just eruption coming across through there, you just get your bait in there. It don't matter what it is. Just hit the water <laughs> and you hooked up. So that's one thing I was going to ask. So like, obviously we don't fish, you know, we don't have a ton of elite series tournaments in the month of September, rarely ever. Um, there's usually just not a ton of tournaments in general in the South and in uh, the month of September, but let's say there was, and it's a lake where, you know, there's potential for schooling fish. You know, are you going to spend your days of practice or at least a couple of them just getting out there super early trying to run points and find schooling fish? Or are you going to, you know, like you mentioned earlier, just cover water, put the trolling motor down, and then if you happen to see them, uh, you know, obviously go for it that way. Like what is your approach when you're on a lake that you know there's a possibility for schooling fish? So what I want to do is I really I just want to kind of ride around the lake. And for us here personally, the schooling fish doesn't start at daylight. You know, that's why I want to go to the bank and try to get that top water bite. Um, it's really kind of that midday deal when, or, you know, eight or nine o'clock when they start doing that. But the way I'm going to find them is literally just putting that boat on pad and riding around the lake. Um, I'm going to be going slow enough to where I'm actually running my 2D sonar as I'm driving in areas that I start marking a lot more bait, you know, start seeing those bait balls on my 2D. You know, that's kind of an area I might try to pay attention to. But really, I mean, you're just looking for the visual, then fish schooling. And, I mean, it's really weird. I don't know why or what it is, but there's always certain locations in a lake where they're going to be doing it more than others. And, I mean, whether it be a long point or whatever it is holding them, you know, they're going to keep on pushing up onto that. And, um, you know, honestly, it's kind of will be a two-pronged approach. Um if I do find that schooling fish activity after they go back down, you know, now we have the capability to chase them around. And that's when you see like what you saw up North, we're going to be 
hit them with the pan optics with the Miki rig. And, but you can actually chase those fish down and keep catching them because they're still chasing that bait under the water nearly just as much as the surface. So you can get right in a hurry doing that. And Ronnie, if you don't, if you don't mind me jumping in real quick, I was going to say, um, I, I can remember being a kid, you know, whenever the fish were school and you always wonder like, where do they go? Like what the heck? Do do? <laughs> but now we don't, we don't really have to worry about that. So like since having the technology of forward facing sonar, uh, you know, typically when those fish go down, like, what are you seeing a lot of times? I know it's different all the time, but like explain to the viewer what a lot of times you're seeing those fish do. A lot of times. So it's going to be usually one of two things. Either they're going to take that ball of bait and just keep going on them. Just like you would imagine they are on the surface and they keep huddling that bait up and just going right through them. Or either those fish are hauling, butt trying to find the next ball of bait. And you got to put your trolling motor on high and just try to stay with them. So if you can figure it out and get them, find them when they're still hitting it, you just see them blasting through that ball of bait under the surface. Oh, I love it. That's one thing I was going to mention was when you're talking about the two pronged approach, you can have top water in your hand all day long in September, but you may be in totally different cover. You may be on some water willow or a seawall in the morning, the first little bit in the back of a pocket around some floating docks, whatever the case may be. And then it's either the same top water or a different one out off points out in the middle of the lake for those, you know, big schools of fish that are busting. Um, do you ever try to make sure that your pockets that you're fishing are close to the schooling areas that you want to be at? Cause I know how it is. Sometimes I go find a juicy pocket where where the great cover great places to fish for a big old head or something in the morning and you might go catch some spotted bass schooling later but it could be 15 miles or 10 miles from your best schooling areas but there's no real creeks down there so are you are you okay with spending some time behind the steering wheel going from your shallow top water stuff to your school and stuff without wasting time or do you just try to find something nearby so you can bing bang boom hit a couple stuff I, if I have time to practice and know an area that they are schooling, I'm probably going to be going down that area and trying to find some top water deal or whatever first thing in the morning. Honestly, I mean, if it's good enough top water deal that I found, maybe hit that. But I want to be in that area because it's one of those timing deals that you you don't really know when it's going to happen. So I want to be there when it does. Um, you know, you can get a general idea, but also at the same time, I'm me personally, I'm not going to be up in the backs of the creeks yet this time of year. I'm going to be on the main lake with that top water deal in the morning. So I, I really, really strongly want to stay on that main lake. Seems like that's where the majority of the fish are and a lot of the bigger fish. But really, when I get ready to catch a big one this time of year, you know, the schooling fish are fun. You can catch a ton of fish, but really the big fish, at least around here, those bigger largemouth, they're going to be in those brush piles. And this is my favorite time for running brush piles. So, you know, I'm going to break out the whole big old net bait, Steve Mac worm, you know, go as cover, try to hit about a hundred of them if I can. If I need to get a limit, I know i got those schooling fish, but if I'm going for some real meat, I'm running brush piles. I don't want to get too specific because I don't want to give away any of your your secrets for your local stuff. But when you're talking about brush piles in September, are you, is this going to be the time of the year where you're finding them in, finding them in the deepest brush, somewhere in the middle, the shallower stuff, like leading into places? Like, what are you know on on a, on a typical lake? What are you looking at as far as depth wise? Um, I mean, it does vary because some of the good brush piles can still be in some of the deeper leading creeks, but. Like I said, again, I'm going to be trying to stay focused on the main lake, you know, out in front of those docks is where most people put them. Try to find some sneaky ones. If you can find some that ain't in front of them docks, that's when it gets real good. But uh, really the depth for me is going to be that 15 to 30. I really want to go for that deeper. But also, you know, pay attention to that thermocline. That thermocline, you know, kind of tell you general area, how deep you want to get. Now, you made a couple top tens this year. You came off one on brownfish up at the St. Lawrence River in Lake Ontario just a week or so ago. And you also had one down at Lay Lake, which is a lot closer to your home. Probably, I think it's about an hour and change from your house. Uh, 
those two top tens you were able to utilize forward facing sonar in the tournament it's a hot button word and topic these days but what has it taught you on clearwater southern spotted bass that which is a predominantly other than the clear water part there's some places that's obviously dingier on the the coosa river or, or alabama river stuff like that but those southern spotted bass utilizing it maybe in timber and things and then going north for it and how smallmouth operate and react and and fish around or swim around do you see anything that you've learned from fishing down back home that has helped you go catch smallmouth better up north 100 percent, because especially lake champlain now champlain might as well have been smith lake for the way those fish were i mean they're nomadic just never stop moving they're chasing a pelagic bait that's just going out through the middle of the lake no rhyme or reason 100 percent. that's you know the deal right now at smith lake is you better be running that chasing those fish down and as soon as i got there on day one it took me i mean just a few hours and figured out that deal and just ran with it the rest of the week. So definitely on that kind of deal, but St. Lawrence river, she's a different animal. <laughs> that place is unreal. I mean, you may think you're doing pretty good with 20 pounds and can go catch some four pounders. <laughs> you're going to get laughed at, but uh, you know, that one's just different just for how you have to find that better quality fish. And it, it's different every time we go there. I mean, I, I don't think a lot of the guys really break down what truly they're doing to find these bigger fish, but there's very subtle little nuances with that lake that, you know, it's not hard to catch those fish whenever you find them, but finding those quality fish is the key. When you find them, they pretty much bite. And that's what I was going to ask was Mark Zona said it on Bassmaster Live talking about Corey Johnston and how when they've shot shows on Ontario together, like Zona will pull in and be like, so, you know, where are we going to go catch them or what are we going to go do? Or I want to go over here. And Corey knows that like there's four and a quarter pounders in this bay and there's four and a half pounders in the mouth of this. And then over by this island, there's four and three quarter pounders. And that's what you're talking about. The subtleties of finding just that above average fish whether it's a four and a half's a big one this week or a five and a half's a big one this week, just knowing that uh, when you guys go up there, how much do you and Patrick Walters as traveling, you know, roommates, teammates, obviously the house got a little bigger this year at times staying with Cobb and LaHue and, and the gang, but like, does that, is that almost essential at times on such a big body of water, two days of practice on like, Hey dude, I was catching four and a half's over here. Well, I was catching four and three quarters over here. And then you start to connect the dots a lot quicker than by yourself. Absolutely. It was really, really big there because I mean, and also Champlain, um, you know, to be able to break these lakes down that much quicker, but you know, for St. Lawrence, it was a deal of, you know, he went over to the Canadian side. I stayed over around like the Tremo side on day one of practice. And, you know, we kind of put our heads together on that. And he kicked my tail over there. But all right, so go ahead and mark that off. Well, then we knew we had that bad day on day one. So I went and practiced the river hard, and he kept, you know, fine-tuning that stuff over on the Canadian side on the lake. But so uh, basically for day one, it was a, hey, follow me. I got you on the river for, for day one. And he's like, all right, day two, let's roll. I got you. And, uh, yeah, so I definitely went with him and utilized his stuff on days two, three, and four. But. And that's key for even getting back not enough for day I mean, one. <laughs> hey, he, he credited it in his tackle tip Tuesday that day one is the day that a lot of people lost this tournament. But the fact that he was able to still catch a, a six pounder and a, and a five pounder in the river, that that's the reason why he won, not because of what he did on the last three days, which is very cool to see. But uh, and it's very key, Kyle, <laughs> as we saw on the final day having a buddy in the top 10 that's not far from you in case you got some mechanical issues. And that, that, that's another deal is at least knowing someone's in the vicinity. It's huge that day. I guess it was day three when he had such a big bag. Uh, he had like 28 pounds, something it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> My motor was messed up. And I mean, on blast stop, I couldn't even get going. I had to turn around, you know, Kenneth came down there, got it worked on, then I sent it down there, just knowing he was there, you know, in case something did happen. And we actually followed each other in at like 
12 o'clock. I mean, I didn't even hardly get to fish, but <laughs> he was already done. You know, I got 28 pounds. I'll come in three hours early. No biggie. <laughs> Just a, it's not even you know it's funny because I I was obviously with you on the last day and saw you on the on I guess the second to last day or the third day of the tournament but uh it, it's it's crazy how big that place is in the sense that like you and Walters were close and you were like seemingly like ten miles away like not even <laughs> <laughs> you look at it on a map like you'd be like oh he's right over there and then you get to going and you're just like we're not even close to him like we're not even in the same like zip code is the other guys around here but uh it is it's crazy up there i just got to thinking about that but uh justin one thing we always do on these podcasts which um you know this one will be a little different because we've talked about kind of three different styles of fishing we've talked about you know your early morning shallow water um going and and you know fishing you know grass things like that shade lines we've talked about schooling fish and then we've obviously talked about brush pile fishing so um we're gonna break it down into three categories i want your top three baits um for those styles of fishing and i want to do uh the schooling fish last because i've got a i've got a specific question about that but um when it comes to early morning shallow water fishing give me your three baits for those and then your top three baits for fishing brush piles later on in the day Okay. First one is going to be a buzz bait. You know, this time of year, a black buzz bait, white buzz bait, whatever. Get you a buzz bait, get that net bait BF toad on there. You can skip it under docks, you can run it down grass lines, whatever. Just cover water fast. Um, that's going to be my number one. And I'm always going to have a walking bait. You know, I love that Yozuri, the 3DB walking bait. That thing is awesome because you can bomb it. Like it has a great action, all that's good, but you can absolutely bomb that thing, get it out there. And that's kind of, you know, back to whether you're throwing on seawalls, you know, grass lines, but also if the schooling fish does come up way on out there, I can get it to it. Ooh. And then the third one, this time of year, I gotta have a jerk bait on. I just like a jerk bait. Just leave it at that. <laughs> you got and that then, 3D big jerk bait. And then for uh, brush pile fishing, like if you had to have a ro rotation of three, obviously you mentioned the worm, but what, what would be your rotation there for brush pile fishing? Yep. Big worm, a jerk bait, just because I catch the crap out of them on brush piles on jerk baits. Because a lot of those bigger fish, they will suspend right over the top of that brush pile. I mean, you'll it, you'll see it. It'll You pull up and there's just one big old blob sitting on top of it suspended you might throw that worm in there and he might chase it down but you get that jerk bait in his face he'll eat it um but then a big jig definitely want to have a big jig to bring the those brush piles and what i always love to, to oh, hold on before you do that before you do that when you throw the big worm out there you can throw it carolina rig you can throw a texas rig but it seems like you always throw a lighter weight than you throw a jig you might throw a three-quarter ounce jig or whatever the specs are and it's different is that the case for you or are you throwing it on a heavy weight as well pegged and unpegged for that t-mac absolutely i'm going to be throwing it on a big shaky head it is going to be a lighter weight okay. no doubt but i like that shaky head or either you know like the swinging head whatever rugby head kind of deal um but i like that just so that worm can stand up it's not going to be just falling over like a normal text freak you might get hung up a little bit more but i think the action is worth it so but usually like a quarter ounce on that whereas the jig would be more of a half ounce five eight something like that perfect go ahead Kyle. no i was just gonna say the one thing that struck me as odd earlier when you were talking about uh, you know, schooling fish, you were basically making it sound or making it out to where you could just throw a boot in there, or a license plate, and they would eat it. <laughs> but at least in my experience, this time of the year in September, it seems like, okay, let's say you're on a good schooling fish lake. When they first start schooling, it's really good. You can catch them on pretty much anything. The more those fish get beat up, though, and people realize that they're schooling fish, they become harder to catch. And at least in my neck of the woods, like growing up, a lot of times you have to throw like basically a crappie jig or a uh, spy bait, <laughs> something really finesse to get them to bite. So like, I'm just curious, like when those fish get really, really difficult to catch, like they're super, super locked in on one bait. Like, what do you do? Cause I think there's almost nothing more frustrating as a bass fisherman than throwing right at a schooling fish that, you know, is big and he won't even acknowledge your bait. So like, what are, what are some of the things you do, uh, you know, when that happens? 
<laughs> that gets me fired up. I can't stand that. But I think what the <laughs> biggest deal is, is not exactly the pressure, but I think they start targeting that smaller bait. For whatever reason, this, you know, through September and October, they start keying in on that bait that I guess was this year's hatch or whatever it may be. And it's tiny. I mean, it's like an inch. And that's when I'm going to go down to really downsizing bait. Like even like, what is it? Um, the little underspin or tail spinners, sure. um, you know, that really small, prof small profile, a little bitty, like little 2.8 inch Kitech or whatever, little small swim bait. When they start getting tricky like that though, if you can't figure out something to get on the bike quick, I get out of there. I go find a different school because <laughs> I will get mad. But also try, try throwing that jerk bait in there and ripping it. I mean, like just you're trying to get a reaction bite out of it. Don't stop, pause it, none of that. Work it until your arm's about to fall off. That, that's what I was going to say. Sometimes you either downsize to the exact profile of the bait and you try to do a non-intrusive presentation to it or – you got to go opposite of the spectrum and throw a mag spoon or throw a, the most vicious looking jerk bait. Have you seen that where you're like, I I've tried everything. And then you throw something that's way bigger than the forage. And you're like, Oh my gosh, they're eating it at least for the next 10 minutes. They're eating it. It might not, it might not happen yes. any other time, but like that, that is <laughs> so you, you've had tangible, tangible experience doing uh, the bigger than normal absolutely i mean i i try everything when you find a school that you know is bad and they're feeding like that they will i'm not gonna say every time because i've had instances where i can't figure it out but they usually will eat something and you just have a bunch of different things tied on i don't care how crazy it seems i've thrown a big slow like big mag draft through there sometimes and they're eating the little one inch bait and they might just smoke that mag draft <laughs> and too sometimes you get that bigger bite so well let's let's go through your normal rep uh, excuse me your normal rotation of schooling fish baits we've talked about a ton but if you could only have three what would be your your three to chase schoolers with uh first is going to be that top water throwing that big, big yozuri top water whether it be the pencil popper or you know just the regular walking um that's number one number two is going to be the jerk bait that jerk bait i can switch it up there's so many different sizes and things you can play with that um i like that jerk bait you can really rip it and it seems like it works every time number three is probably going to be a little bit of a sneaky one but it's it's a jigging spoon like a five eighths or three quarter ounce jigging spoon because you can throw that thing a mile and it's usually that small little bait fish profile and it hits the water and i mean about as soon as it hits the water, you just go ahead and pull into it. But that little jig and spoon, it's, it's sneaky. You so keep tell like me the silver, how you fish it. Go silver ahead. hooks on it, like the crummy silver hooks that come out of the package. Is that what you keep on there? <laughs> yes. That way I can hook up with seven of them, and maybe one of them will finally get to the boat. <laughs> Ronnie, oh, go Cotton ahead. Cordell. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask you this question. We were talking about it before we started the podcast about uh, life before forward facing sonar and life after fa forward facing sonar. Uh, if there is life after it, who knows? Armageddon might happen. But for you fishing <laughs> for fishing in September before it, is there any still is there any things that you did then that are tried and true and haven't gone away? They may not get used as much as they used to, but it's a way to catch fish in the fall or late, late summer. That's tough. That's not reliant on looking down. There's still some, you know, times of the year, um, you know, patterns, instincts that go into it. Is there anything that you've developed over the years before it that you're like, man, that's still, that still catches them. Even if it's something we don't see roll out in a tournament format, that still catches them. Basically everything I just said is what I've been doing since I was a kid. And now I think the only thing that's changed is you could throw a Demiki rig in there for just when those fish go back down and aren't feeding on the surface still. I have that Demiki rig, but also that spoon. Because before forward facing, I would just bomb cast that spoon around, you know, that area that I knew they were schooling, and hopefully I would, you know, eventually run into them. I think the only thing that's changed is now I can see where they're going after they go back down or even 
even when it's brush pile fishing, I'm not having to coordinate, you know, here's that dock to this dock kind of deal. I can pull up, see the brush, and I'm throwing into it. I'm not sitting there, you know, trying to pick out every little fish in the brush pile. I just want to be able to see the brush where I make an accurate cast the first time, and then I roll out. Still using the same techniques as I always have. Um, you know, it to me, it's just more time efficient. And time efficient on the water, you catch more fish. Now, Justin, we've we've talked a lot in this podcast about how uh, difficult it is to fish in the month of September. Um, and I think the reality of it is there's plenty of guys that put the fishing rod down and turn the TV on and watch college football this time of year. So <laughs> got to ask, uh, how many wins are your Alabama Crimson Tide going to have this year? And uh, what, are, what are we predicting for the season? Mm, oh, it's going to be a tough one this year. I think we're going to go 11 and two. It's going to be a terrible season for Alabama. We just don't have a quarterback. We only have three of them. So is that is that 11 <laughs> and one in the regular season and a loss in the postseason? Or is that a. Uh, Absolutely. Because uh, okay. we ain't going to give a crap. We're, we're just looking towards next year. <laughs> we're ready I for still, that 12 game playoff. I, I still think that, you know, every year that football happens that Alabama's got a good shot at being in the top four, even when you guys are the most pessimistic, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a good life know. to live. I'm going for the worst thing that could possibly happen. And that's 11 to everything else is a bonus after that. Can you imagine what Alabama fans will do? Like one day if the, if they actually lose like four games in a season, like, like just imagine the end of the be calling for Nick Saban's head. <laughs> Firing. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Brasher and half of our office will literally like go insane if the if Alabama goes eight and four in the regular season. Like if that ever happens, there's gonna be more people just go nuts here in Alabama than we know what to do with that thing. Yeah, so, I so, can't wait. I mean, I'm a big Alabama fan, but it's hilarious watching some of these people. <laughs> While we're on it, Kyle, don't don't get mad at me. I'm a transplanted Razorback fan now, but. I still love college you football. With that trans start. I I I I like <laughs> I, I like uh I, yeah I, I went in the portal when I moved to Arkansas and I, and I chose the Razorbacks, but I still admire some college football venues and teams. And so Hamner, I've got the opportunity to go to the Alabama game when they play Tennessee or when they play LSU. Which one should I choose if I could only choose one this year to go to? If it's in Bryant Denny, both of them, which one do I go to? LSU. It's so much fun. I mean, I know Tennessee won last year, so it'll oh, probably I be know. pretty dang good too. I know. I want to see them. <laughs> that's the only thing that's kind of a little bit different. But it is it's nuts on campus when LSU comes to town because they travel well and – that quad gets rocking before the game starts, but I would say LSU. It is a good atmosphere. Well, I have to I have to mark my calendar off on that one then, because I I think I got the hookup to go to go check out a uh, Alabama game in in Alabama. Yeah. Um, Kyle, we've got now if they're like fish, four and four, don't do that one. <laughs> hey, that would be a crucial <laughs> one though. Do they fire Saban after that game, or if he wins, he gets to play another week? You know, he gets to coach another week. Oh no, I'm talking about if LSU's four and four. Don't. Oh, oh, okay. I was about to Tennessee. say. Tennessee. Well, okay, four and four ain't happening. <laughs> I, I Saban is to, still here. <laughs> I, I was about to say, uh, Kyle. Well, you can see that the podcast has gotten excited because we're not talking about bass fishing in the month of September. But do you have anything else uh, related to catching a bass in September? that we can ask our man, Justin Hamner. I do not. I think Justin covered it as well as possible. Uh, I think that um, obviously I'm not the pro, but I think Justin explained it very well. It is a difficult time of the year to fish unless you're further north where, uh, you know, the fish are really starting to feed up and you're starting to get those fall um, tendencies. But yeah, I mean, really in September, it seems like the the one thing you can do is pray for some colder nights, hope the fish start biting and, uh, if if not, then, you know, I, it's tough. It is certainly tough. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's my biggest tip is just head north as far as you can. I don't <laughs> care. Get a passport. <laughs> It'll be worth it. <laughs> I've got I've got two questions for you. Unrelated to catching them in this time of the year, uh, 
why are you the self-proclaimed sexiest man in the elite series? I, I don't know where I just started noticing that during weigh-ins. Where the heck did that come from? I thought that was a given. I don't really know what why everybody keeps asking me that. I thought it was understood, <laughs> but whatever. No, you're self-proclaimed. That means that so, you're trying to convince people. Like I already knew you were sexy, but you're having to convince people. Who exactly. were the ones you're trying to convince over here? honestly it was pretty funny so you know mercer's back there backstage doing his top ten call out bill well you know everybody in front of me we got you know patrick <laughs> and chris and all them and there's just like a 30 different things that they can list off well it gets to me and he's like oh yeah fast magic classic qualifier and that's about it i'm like sexiest sexiest man on tour you ain't got nothing else. Just go hell with it. So he just starts <laughs> laughing. I just thought he was going to joke. He would have said it, and I think he stuck. I don't know. It was That's pretty hilarious. funny. <laughs> it, it was funny, and I was like, was there a dinner or a bet or something involved? So I'm glad that it was just off the top of the head, and you spew that confidence. Speaking of that confidence, we saw Kyle Welcher get off to a really good start in the Elite Series and then have a really tough year last year, shockingly. Almost, and, and his only good event was second in the classic. You are his twin. You had a great start to your lead series career. And last year, absolutely did not have a good season, except for the classic where you got fourth, I believe. What was the deal for 2022 for you to turn it around and have a good 2023 back to what you would expect you to do on the elite series? But it, it was eerie how that was the case for Welcher and his high point was Hartwell. And the same thing goes for you but you both missed this year's classic and now have both turned around and had a great year to make next year's classic. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, it, it's a mental, I mean, I know everybody says it. This is the biggest mental game. If you're not mentally in it and ready, you're going to get your butt whooped. I mean, you can try to act like you're there. And I mean, I work just as hard as everybody else, but I mean, when you got a little, <laughs> three-year-old girl back home that don't even want to talk to you because she's so mad that you're gone. It starts it starts messing with you a little bit as bad as you don't want to admit it, but not making any excuses. But, you know, that that's one side of things that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, you have to take care of stuff back home and get all that squared away 100% before you can be completely in this and compete how you want to compete. I mean, for me, I, I had terrible fish losses and all that mess last year. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, just looking back, just mine wasn't right. And we got it back right and got it back on track. So I'm glad we did that. <laughs> we like to see that. Any thoughts about Grand Lake before we let you go when it comes to thinking about the Classic next year? We can't ask you any thoughts about next year's schedule because I don't want to reveal anything, you know, this or that. So <laughs> yeah, apparently Bass don't want to reveal that. <laughs> soon soon i'll say i'll say from when the airing of this uh, okay. podcast is it's soon <laughs> okay but uh yeah a grand lakes a lake that i've always like it sets up like so many lakes back home and that time of year oh i love fishing that time of year put a jig in my hand big spinner bait kind of stuff but it also has started leaning a little bit of course towards that live scope deal but I don't know. Just the way it sets up, I really like it. So either way, it's going to be fun. I made the freaking classic. That is fun. Kyle, I'm glad that you dropped. We dropped a good, healthy list of Elite Series pros we could have chose for September, but we decided to choose Justin Hamner, our guy. Another classic qualification under his belt. Sexiest man on tour, according to himself. And uh, now uh, setting his <laughs> Just sights leave on... that part out of it. Yeah, oh, I, sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean. I didn't say that. Nobody heard that. Um, yeah. Appreciate you joining us on the Pattern Month episode for the Inside Bassmaster Podcast, brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee Company. Justin, have a great off season. I hope you catch as many fish as you want to, or watch as much football as you want to. And we will see you in February when we kick off the elite season, and then we'll get to shake hands at the Bassmaster Classic. I know I don't get to see you on the road as much, but we will see you in Tulsa for that one. Absolutely. I can't wait. Thank you all so much for having me on. I'm here if y'all ever need, you know, some more entertainment or just want to pick on me on these worst months. <laughs> we'll do, we'll do January next. We'll do January next. Awesome. Oh, I like January. Okay. Let's go okay. for August. <laughs> okay. We'll do that.